Well, hello everyone. Welcome to episode four of our Make Along series. Welcome back. Um, welcome back to the new normal. I hope everyone is uh, adjusting and adapting. It's just absolutely crazy. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. Take a little break from what's going on and um, dedicate some time to yourself to refine your skills, refine your craft, to get some great therapy behind the bench. So today's episode will be cutting and piercing with the jeweler's saw. The jeweler's saw is a tool that I consider a daily driver behind the bench and um, it goes way beyond the utility of having to cut something. It's a wonderful and amazing tool. I will be very honest with you, I uh, hated it's a strong word, but I hated, severely disliked, and dreaded using the jeweler saw when I first started and would do anything to avoid using it. But once it clicked, what an amazing tool it is and how the blades are engineered and what those teeth do, it's a fabulous, fabulous tool. So today, if you're struggling with the saw, I think today's lesson could be life-changing. Uh, if you're not struggling with the saw, well, great, so keep on keeping on. The thing about the saw is when you're first starting out, you have some margin for error because you're cutting shapes like ovals or scalloped edges or, you know, your, your work's a little rough, more on the art jewelry side. But if, if you uh, plan to go into fine jewelry, the saw, you'll really need to hone your precision with the saw for cutting out precise settings and the precision work that you'll need to do. So practice, practice, practice with the saw. Please, the blades that you break, you are more concerned than I will ever be in the studio about how many blades the students break. Please consider it par for the course. You're going to break blades. I'm going to give you my best tips and tricks to help mitigate that and alleviate your frustration and shorten your learning curve a good deal. This is a daily driver tool in your hand on the bench serving you every day. So put in the time because it is a foundation skill and a pillar of your craft. And you know what? It's pretty awesome and it's not so bad. So, all right. Now, um, I had shown you the components of these last week, my Southwest scalloped cactus earrings. So here they are, they're finished. They're wonderful and shiny. So I have our base scallop here, my base scallop layer to saw with you today. And then I have this simple, what you're making doesn't have to be fancy. I'd rather you be behind the bench, just practice sawing out basic shapes and piercing out basic shapes because all of these are wonderful exercises. When you need the precision of sawing a straight line, when you need to master uh, a, a curve, when you need to master a corner, when it has to be precise. So if you're not sure what to make, pierce out and cut out some basic shapes. Can't go wrong, it's wonderful practice. All right, this is a standard jeweler saw frame. They haven't changed much over the years. There are some newfangled saw frames out there, but please don't think that one of those is the answer. If you can't saw with this, you can't saw with this or uh, there's a new concept saw out there and some people feel that it's the saw. Well, it's not. I uh, love you all, <laughs> but it's the operator at this point. If you can't drive stick shift on an 89 Escort, you can't drive stick shift on a Carrera. But if you can drive stick shift on that 89 Escort, you are going to have a lot of fun with that Carrera. So right now it is not the tool, it's the operator. So standard jeweler saw frame. Saw frames are measured by the throat. And this is your throat size. So here I have a three inch throat saw. Here I have a four inch throat saw. Here I have a five inch throat saw. And here is a ginormous something throat saw, maybe six or eight inches. You don't need to have such a wide collection and variety of saw frames. It really depends on the work that you do. I have a peer that uses uh, the most adorable little two and three quarter throat saw frame because the work that they do is always pretty small. 
Uh, I find for me, a four inch is just a great general all purpose saw frame, but again, it depends on the work that you do. So if back to uh, the cuff bracelet, I think that was week two, the cuff bracelet that we worked on, if you have a three inch throat saw frame, you are going to notice that you get clearance issues with the throat. So if you find that you're doing a lot of large pieces where you need that throat size, then you will need, or if you're rescuing vintage pieces or, or just cutting up, repurposing things and recycling, upcycling things, you'll see when a larger throat saw will be of benefit to you. But this for your everyday daily driver, in my humble opinion, is a lot. But, uh, Right, so that's that. Now I do, uh, I did treat myself, treated myself, I think it was last year, the year before, to a Green Lion saw frame, and it's a wonderful frame, it's a dude, and he makes them, and they're pretty great, and uh, it's just a great, it's a great comfortable saw, saws like a dream. Okay, so that's what I'll be using today. Uh, all right, so there's your saw, and uh, how they're measured. Now these pieces and parts are all adjustable and replaceable. And while they're very simple parts, you want your saw frame to provide you reliable service every time you sit down behind the bench to use it. Just like your automobile. Yes, the parts are all replaceable, but when you need to get somewhere, that's not the time to find that you didn't maintain your vehicle and your parts have failed. So it's a very simple tool and each one of these pieces and parts is very important. And we'll get to that when I talk to you about loading up your saw blade and how to put up your frame at the end of your working session. So we have some wing nuts here. We have a washer here. We have a very important plate here. And then we have the static part of the frame. And then we have this part up here that I use to hook on the bench to load up my saw blades. All right, so speaking of blades, let's talk about some blades. All right, blades are measured uh, by number. And the higher the number, the coarser the blade. So just as a reference, think about a Home Depot bandsaw blade. The teeth are humongous and bejaggly and pretty far apart from one another because they're meant to cut thick bejaggly material. So we have a really coarse blade. So here in our world, the higher the number, the coarser the blade. The coarser the blade means fewer teeth per inch and bigger toothis for thicker material. Then we go the other way. So we go down in number to a finer blade and then we go below zero. And when we go below zero, we're in what's called the ought system. And, oh, I do not have a pack of blades with me. So if you see a blade, a pack of blades that says three, it's a size three blade. If you see a pack of blades that says three slash zero, that's very different. Three slash zero is a three aught blade and a three aught blade is finer than a three. So you could draw yourself a little chart here and you'll see as we go up in the aught scale, we have a finer blade, whereas we go up in the positive number, we have a coarser blade. Um, some of it is a bit of personal preference. Some of it is, oh my goodness, it's the only blade I have in the studio. There is a wide window. It's not a one for one, a two aught for this, a two for that, a four aught for this. So you have a little bit of a range in your gauges. I don't use this, you know, put it in your noodle as a, as a, as a thing. Three teeth for the thickness of your metal, I have heard that. I don't use that. I have my my little range of blades that I use for the work that I do in the studio. And that's just kind of, that's the lane I stay in. Um, so that might be helpful for you to have at your bench. Um, okay, wonderful. Now we do sell a kit with your blades. We uh, A blade pack and assortment where you get a variety of size two down to four aught. And you can see what you like, what you use. Um, we also have a bench pin with clamp in that kit and a German saw frame for you and also some cut lube or I might have substituted the cut lube for beeswax, which we'll get into. So that's available on the website. Okay, any questions about blades? Anybody? Anybody? Questions about blades and toothis? Okay. All right. So the first thing 
that will make your life with the saw easier is loading your blade correctly. The blade gets loaded only one way. So when we look at our blade, we have a flat back of the blade. We have our teeth. The teeth, the saw cuts on the downstroke. That means the teeth have to face out and down. So when we load up a blade, the flat back of the blade faces the flat back of the frame. The teeth face out and down. Well, how can I tell? Sometimes the toothes are so fine that it's hard to see. That's all right. You know what will never fail you? Your finger. If your blade is loaded the right way and the teeth are facing down, the teeth of the blade will catch on the pads of your fingerprints. So don't start a new thing. No one saws on the upstroke. You're going to make a whole lot of racket. You're going to have a really tough time. So run your finger up the blade, and I will tell you if the blade is loaded the right way, if the if the teeth of the blade catch on the pads of your fingerprints. All right, so that's thing one. That's pretty easy. All right, so let's load one of these up. One of the biggest pitfalls that I think buddy nettle smiths run into when they're learning to use the saw is not having the correct tension on the blade, which creates a waterfall of problems. So you would think that I just load my blade in right here. First, I'm gonna undo the top wing nut. How you load this frame is your personal preference. I use this little hook at the top to brace it on my bench. I undo this top wing nut here. And I place the blade between the plate and the static part of the frame, and I tighten that up. Now you would think then I just put the bottom in the same way and I'm ready to go. No, this is a nightmare. What will happen here, if you try and saw like this, you will saw, but the blade will bow back. You will shove forward and it becomes a battle of twits. And this is going to win. You're going to make a, a rather simple process and be more difficult than it needs to be. So. Another quick tip is to make sure that you have the correct tension on your frame. And that's what they're, they're engineered for that. So I have to stand up and do it when I'm here because I'm on a, a chair with wheels. <laughs> so what I'll do is I have the top loaded. I'll brace, I'll brace the saw on my bench and I use my body weight to lean in. All right, I'm leaning in and I don't know if you could see that, but as I lean in, the saw frame flexes. Well, it's engineered to do that. So I'll go ahead and load the bottom in. I'm gonna press in with my body weight. What you can't see here is that the blade is going a little bit wiggly. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this up. And then as I release, can you hear that? I have more of a high-pitched a high pitched sound. That sounds wonderful. That's what I wanna hear. That's what I want you to hear. I don't want you to hear a dull banjo sound. So that's the sound I want to hear. Um, all right, so we talked about the frame, its components. We talked about its size. We talked about blades and how they're measured. And we talked about how to load up your saw frame. Let me tell you what makes this tool so amazing and we'll also talk about some of the things that make it amazing beyond its simple utility of I have to cut something. So what makes this tool so special is the way the teeth are engineered. There are three parts, there are three parts, <laughs> there are three parts of the teeth. One part of the tooth cuts your metal. Another part of that tooth sweeps that cut out of the way. So the next tooth can cut and sweep. But the marvel of the saw blade is a part of that tooth is also a file. What? Yes, a part of that tooth is also a file. Now you don't realize that when you're just starting out because you're breaking blades and you're cursing and you're swearing and you might be cutting your finger and you're hating the saw. But one day that light bulb will click and it will all come together and you'll realize what an amazing tool the saw is. So if your form is correct, each part of that tooth can do what it's meant to do, which is cut sweep and file. So it's an amazing tool. 
So speaking of its utility beyond cutting, when your smiling faces are here in the studio, I always take out my laptop and I ask, and I show you, and I ask you to execute this search at home to look up and see what other artisans are doing with the saw frame for you to get some inspiration and see beyond the utility of I have to cut something. The search that I will recommend that you execute, no judgment when anybody's into, but um, at the risk of getting an eyeball full of things that you can never unsee, I suggest terms like metalsmith, jewelers, saw, piercing. That Google search will yield you many, many, many results. And you'll see how people, just like you, learn and use this saw in very artful ways. You can use this saw to draw. Now, I can't have my laptop up here with me, but when you execute that search, you should see what I mean. And an example would be to saw out a tree in winter, where I would use the saw to cut the trunk, but then I would continue using the saw as a line drawing to continue sawing out branches. That makes sense when you see the results of the Google search, that will be clear to you what I mean to use the saw to draw. Uh, the saw can also be used on the back of, I'm going to show, I didn't do it here, but you could imagine. Some stones are finished on the back. This one was not because it's stabilized turquoise, but if it were finished on the back, I could have opted to cut out a little seam in my back plate. I could have cut out a cactus, I could have cut out anything. And there's a little surprise behind the back plate where the finished stone can show through. I've done it on pieces in the past, I did not do it here, uh, but there are some wonderful examples that pop up in that Google search that will show you how people do just that. And that's a really interesting, artful thing, design element, embellishment to add to your pieces. So um, make friends with the saw because it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tool. Okay, so we've talked about the artful way it can be used, so please execute that Google search. Um, all right, so this is some personal preference here, but when you think about the science of the blade going through your material, there will be friction. So to alleviate that friction, you can either use some good old spit, if you like, you can also use cut lube, you could also use beeswax. So when I use beeswax, you could load the beeswax on the front of the teeth, but what I find is the beeswax clogs the teeth and makes a lot of bees wax dust with every few saw strokes you find yourself blowing the dust uh, out of your way out of your line of sight uh, so two tricks are to either load the back of the saw blade if you like another trick is to wax or lubricate the back of your piece so here's the front here's the back and the saw will pick up the beeswax from the back and you won't have the schmutz beeswax schmutz on the front. So I hope that, I hope you find that to be helpful. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do just that. I'm gonna go ahead and beeswax it up. Okay. All right, so you must be wondering, well, how do I get my design on my material? And I have to tell you, there is no good way. They're all pretty, hmm. Uh, none of them are excellent, but I'll talk to you about ways you can do it. One way is just a Sharpie marker. You can sharpie mark your design if you like. If you have a really intricate design, I would not suggest you do this because as you're manipulating your piece on the bench pin to saw, which we'll get into when I demonstrate, you may rub the sharpie marker completely off. But, uh, but that is option one. Option two is what's called a scribe. A scribe is a sharp, pokey implement, and you can use the sharp, pokey implement to draw your design or a scribe over your sharpie marker. You can also sharpie marker over your scribe line if you like. Uh, I am not a very good drawer, so I usually don't use the scribe, but when I do use the scribe, it's uh, for this piece, for example, you're not gonna be able to see the scribe line, but believe me, there's a scribe line on there, and I use the scribe to trace around in my oval template. So I had the perimeter of the template to brace the scribe against on my material. So now I have my shiny line oval and the shiny line will never go away. So the scribe is another option for you. 
Another option is uh, tracing paper, which I've done here, and a very high-tech method, a glue stick. So you could use a glue stick with your tracing paper. What I would recommend is that you glue stick your piece, the top of your piece, you glue stick the back of your tracing paper, you take the time to adhere it well, and let it dry. The teeth of the saw blade will look for any available edge to lift and peel and tear. If the glue stick isn't dry, your design will shift and shimmy uh, across your piece. That's very frustrating. So make sure you have ample time for your, your pieces to dry and make sure that the glue goes to the perimeter of the tracing paper to mitigate any of those potential issues. Uh, you can use spray adhesive. Now I'm not giving spray adhesive a bad rap because spray adhesive says I will adhere if you spray me. So that's wonderful. That really does a great job of adhering. The only problem you have is on the back side. It's a bit of a pain to remove, but worth it because your piece stays put, which is what I need when I'm sawing. Another option, I don't have a laser printer here. Your mileage will vary, but I've read that you could print your design uh, with a laser printer and then place that design on your piece upside down and rub it with alcohol and the toner should transfer to your piece. So I don't have a laser printer, but for those of you that do, please try it and I hope that works for you. I did think that a shipping label would be sticky enough to stick, but not so sticky that it wouldn't unstick. And it was pretty sticky uh, and it did not unstick. But the good news is if you have a printer and you're doing multiple designs, you could print your designs on your shipping label and adhere that and do all your sawing and then get a little bottle of goo gone and just you'll have to take a little bit more time to undo the shipping label, but that's another option for you. So as you can see, none of them are super terrific, but you'll pick one that works for you. Uh, okay, so we've talked about that. All right, I think I'm ready to show you how to cut. Okay, so I have this demo here to show you how to pierce. Well, I think I'm gonna cut the scallop piece out because you can see that I'm wearing them. So I wanted to show you how I made them. Um, so I'll save this guy for the piercing demo. Do you have any questions? Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mwah. Okay, so let me, let's load it up. Oh, you know what I've got here? My safety glasses. What a fashionable, what a fashionable accessory but definitely more fashionable than having to make an eye patch, which the only cool thing about that is that you could make an eye patch, but I don't wanna to have to make an eye patch. So when these blades break, the bottom and the top stay in, the middle goes somewhere. You know where it could go? Right in your peeper, and who needs that? So I would suggest that you wear your safety glasses. Now, if you wear glasses, glasses, I would not suggest wearing your glasses, glasses as eye protection when I have heavy machinery, because I don't know the impact resistance of your lenses, but I would like to think that glasses may save your saw blade from getting you in the eyeball, but you know, you can never go wrong with safety glasses. I prefer the, um, you know, 70s science nerd glasses. Um, we have them here in the studio. If you want them, you can get them. Okay, so I have my saw loaded up, ready to go. I was gonna use my green line, but I'll use this guy because he's here and he's loaded up. So let me just give him some of these marks over here. Okay, and I've, I lubed up the back of the piece here. So this is your bench pin. The bench pin is such a personal thing in a metalsmith uh, in a jeweler's studio. Some people have a nub that they've been working with for 30 years and it's, it's like, it's just right for them. I happen to prefer this rectangular shape with the keyhole cut out of it. Um, you could also cut with your jeweler saw or whatever tool you have. You can make your own little notches and your own little eye lens in here and your own little cutouts for when you have smaller things to pierce. The most important part of this bench pin is the fact that it provides a space for you to brace your material. I'm going to give you the example and you could choose what you want to be. Boys and girls, choose. You could be a sewing machine or a scroll saw. It doesn't matter to me. My scroll saw does not have a presser foot, but my sewing machine does. And if you sew, this analogy will make great sense to you. The presser foot holds down my fabric as the feed dogs gather with each stitch to pull my fabric through. Well, I don't have a presser foot here. And just like we talked about on day one, 
everything we do here is a manual version of an otherwise mechanized process. So you know what my presser foot is, you know what my clamp is, it's my hand. So the most important part of this bench pin that I have space to clamp my piece down. The more play I have with the piece as I'm sawing, the more up and down movement, the more I have to fight with it, the more chances I have to break the blade. So the blades are strong, but any unnecessary tension on them and they will snap and break. It's frustrating, you have to stop what you're doing, you have to reload the blade, it ruins your, your chi while you're sawing, which one day, maybe not today, but one day you'll find this to be, at least I do, rather meditative task. So the better you clamp your piece down, the easier time you'll have. Does clamping get any easier as the years go by? No, my hand still cramps, but I know how important it is to clamp my piece down. Now you will try every which way to hold this. The way that I find is the best is my two fingers down so that to the left and the right of wherever I'm sawing, my piece is braced and clamped. Um, very rarely do I saw off the edge of the bench pin. I know sometimes you will have a need for that. Uh, but usually I prefer the notch here so that I could have an even space to place my material and brace it. But sometimes you will need to cut off the side of the bench pin. Again, just make sure that your piece is as well braced as you can. Okay, so back to my sewing machine or my scroll saw. This is such a basic task in such a basic form and movement. When I hit the switch on my sewing machine and I depress the foot pedal, what does that needle do? Or when I turn my scroll saw on, what does that blade do? It does nothing but straight up and down. That's it. It doesn't do this, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do this, it does this. And my job with my sewing machine is to control my speed and my cadence with a foot pedal. So when with my scroll saw also, I'm guiding my material. I'm a few cuts ahead with my sewing machine. I'm a few stitches ahead so that I could, I could uh, uh, be mindful of the cadence and I can adjust accordingly with my sewing machine. If I need to slow down, then I could slow down. I can reposition. So same thing here. When your switch flips that you're sawing, it's just this, it's straight up and down. And you meter your cadence accordingly as I'm turning, as I'm shifting my metal. So you're kind of like a DJ here. This is your little turntable. And as I'm sawing, I'm always keeping that blade moving and I'm always moving and anticipating where I need to move and shift my piece next while keeping the blade moving so that it doesn't break or it's less prone to be stressed. So what I'd like you to do, if you're just starting out, I would like for you to give me one downstroke with the saw, no forward pressure. When you're ready, give me a little forward pressure. I'm guiding, I'm anticipating, and I'm going to have a turn here. Keep that frame blade moving. here. So if I have more bench pin action here, great. Shift your carcass over this way. And I have a nice wide open space here for a few of these scallops before I'll have to reposition again. Notice my frame is straight up and down. The only time I tilt my frame a wee bit forward is if I'm trying to saw a straight line because I have more of the teeth to contact my material when I tip my frame forward a wee bit. But otherwise, you'll notice my saw frame is straight up and down.
Nope, don't like that. Okay. <laughs> to the end I slow down it hurts when you get a full downstroke of the saw through your finger but most of us are pretty hardcore a little dab of crazy glue on that bad boy and we move on but it's very unpleasant to uh, to to cut yourself with the saw blade it makes a paper cut look like an ice cream social um, so what I didn't tell you is and I think it's just human nature. If you find yourself struggling with the saw, I bet you, you will clamp down on this handle. White knuckling the saw frame is the worst thing you can do. If you feel yourself getting frustrated and you feel yourself white knuckling the saw frame, the Kung Fu death grip, that's the time for you to take a break and walk away because it's what will happen, I don't know if you can see this, but as I pump the saw frame, look how much it shifts. If you think you were having trouble before, it's like riding down the road with your car out of alignment. Try sawing like this and fighting with the saw blade as you've torqued the frame at least a quarter of an inch. So what you can't see, but you can when you're here in the studio, I'm holding on to the saw frame, kind of, barely, so it doesn't fall out of my hand. So the action of holding it with the Kung Fu death grip and driving it isn't what does it. The action of sawing is I'm just mechanizing my saw manually and guiding my material with a little bit of forward pressure. That's the deal. Um, so everyone wants to know, measure your progress. Am I getting better? So here's how you measure your progress. When you, and you can't see this here, but you see it when I hand it to you in the studio. And it's no big deal when you're just starting out if you have to go back and refine with a file. But to measure your progress and see if your form and cadence were good, and each part of that tooth could do its job, cut, sweep, and file, examine, examine the path that your saw has traveled because it tells the story. You'll be able to see everywhere you broke a blade. You'll be able to see every bejaggly stop start. If every part of that tooth did its job and cut, swept, and filed, there will be no refining for you to do. And you'll be able to see the beautiful path that your saw blade has traveled on and each part of that tooth did its job, cut, sweep, and file. It's not the end of the world when you're starting out if you have to go back and refine with your file. But as you get on down the road, labor. It's labor. You have to go back. It's another step that you have to go back and do another round of work when the work really should have been done in the first time you did the task, which was with the saw. Um, the saw also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you now about how to pierce uh, and how I could go back if I needed to do any refining and how I could use the saw as a file. Now, speaking of cutting yourself, sometimes that is when the saw slips for me. So here, the saw is kind of cruising along in the little channel of the, of the material that you're cutting. But when you're using the saw as a file, you're really bracing the saw up against the side of your material and you're going slow and steady using it as a file. And that's the time for me that I find the saw blade is most prone to jump and give me a nice full downstroke in my finger. Um, so make sure you have some band-aids and neosporin in the studio. So hey, let me talk to you about piercing because we know how to cut and that's when I have to cut a, a shape out. What do I do if I need to pierce? If I need to cut from the inside out? Well, we learned how to use the center punch, I think in our first class when we drilled our hole. So same thing here. I have my automatic center punch. I have my little sample piece here. Now, I'm not going to be careful here where I drill my hole because it's a demo, but if you would like to salvage or save this piece, maybe I'll use it, maybe this, maybe I could put a post 
on this piece here and put a jump ring and dangle this from this part. Maybe this could make its own separate stud earring, post earring. If you want to be careful and save this, be mindful where you put your pierce hole so that you could salvage the piece that you're cutting. If you don't care, it doesn't matter. So for now, just because it's my little demo, I'm just going to... All right, so I've made my divot for the drill bit to ride in, and you know where I'm going now. I'm going to the drill press with my safety glasses to drill my hole, and I'll show you that's the one extra step we need to do before we pierce our material, so I'll be right back. All right, please sand the back of your piece so that I don't have nubbies that could hinder my ability to turn uh, and manipulate and maneuver my piece on the bench pin because I need smooth action here while I have smooth action here. So the only extra step with piercing is that I have to drill my hole and then I have to load this piece onto my saw frame so that I could cut from the inside out. So everywhere, I only have one point of entry here, but everywhere that you are piercing needs a hole. So what I'll do is I'll brace my saw frame against my work table and I will load my piece on. And I always put it all the way up to the top so it doesn't drag the blade down. I'm gonna to have to stand up again to put tension on my frame. So I'm going to seat the blade in the bottom, cover it with my thumb and uh, lean in with my body weight. The blade goes wiggly. I'm gonna go ahead and tighten that up. That was not tight. Much better. And now you see that my piece is on there and I'm able to now saw from the inside out. length of the blade. Sometimes I have to have a short, tight stroke. Sometimes I have the luxury of a nice, long, smooth cadence. And now I have the middle part pierced out of my shape. Uh, this is a great practice piece. What I plan on doing with these guys is I'll cut out the, the bigger shape. I'll go ahead and cut out the bigger shape here and then I'll probably do some little tooling marks here, and, uh, and that's that. Well, hey, you know what? Let me show you how to use. Let me find my scallop piece, which couldn't have gone far. Here we go. So what I wanted to show you here is another basic, easy way to add some dimension to your pieces. Nothing wrong with pieces that are flat, but a dapping block can make uh, some dimension for you in your pieces, and the good news is, is it's not an expensive tool. You can also fashion one yourself if you're handy in your workshop and you have some wood, you can scoop out or carve out some shapes. Uh, but dapping blocks also come already made for you. We have square ones here in the studio. We sell oval ones here in the studio. And, uh, and it's, it's just a nice, it's a nice little extra for you to have. So here is a square wooden dapping block with some, with some uh, indentions in it. Now these dapping blocks come with two little wooden punches and then I have my oval dapping block, 
watch if you remember from the cuff bracelet I don't know if, if those of you that didn't go all the way to the end of the video you missed a neat tip where I took my cuff bracelet stock and I used uh, a mallet and my punch to kind of do um, some synclastic forming without a hydraulic press and without sinusoidal stakes. So I did go back over the week with my ball peen hammer, which was a little big for the job, but I originally demonstrated using my mallet and my wooden punch in the indent of my oval dapping block, and that worked really well. Um, and I got some terrific results when I went back. I could really use a finer hammer, a smaller hammer, but I don't have one. Um, but uh, I got some great results when I tried to put my ball peen hammer in that form against the wooden uh, indention of my wooden dapping block. And I think that's definitely something for you to play with for those of you that want to start to experiment with some uh, synclastic forming. Okay, so well, I have a lot of gunk on here from my beeswax residue and my tracing paper. So really, I would go and clean this off at the sink uh, with my brass brush. But... Uh, I'm not going to do it, but you know I would do it, but I'm not going to do it right now. So I'll take my, and I think the table's going to get a little shaky, shaky here, but um, so whichever way you want the front to be. So there's no law. You can dap these. So the way I dapped my little cactus desert earrings is I dap them this way. You see this, this way, but you could also make it like a scoop and do it <laughs> this way. Does that make any sense at all? I'll show you when I when I dap this guy. Right. Get in there. Okay, so I have my mallet over here. All right, we can get a little shaky. So I'm gonna place my punch in my indent. So you'll hear a, a dull, dull, dull sound, and then you'll hear a crisper sound. When you hear that crisper sound, that indicates that the piece has reached the bottom of the tool. There you go. So I'm going to manipulate the punch. All around. So that it completely conforms to, completely conforms to the indent that I've chosen. Now, if you're going, uh, sometimes you have to do several rounds of, of sizes. I can't ask my metal, sometimes if the indent is very severe, I can't ask my flat sheet of metal uh, sometimes to go right into this shape here. It will dimple and pucker. So sometimes you have to do uh, a progression of shaping and forming to get to your final destination. So keep that in mind. You'll experience some trial and error so uh, you'll see I have beeswax residue and all sorts of schmutz here, but I, so I don't know if you can see this. But you can either use this tool to give you a scoop, if you like, it could scoop in, or you could use it to dome out. So that's pretty cool. So this guy is $7.95, you can't beat it. I don't remember how much this guy is, but he's not a fortune. So that's a, a nice tool to add to your collection and give you some options for some different things to do with your pieces. I think we've covered saw frames, sizes, blades, form, cadence, bench pin, bracing. We've talked about a good search for you to execute on the web, the World Wide Web, for you to see how other artisans use the saw. And we've talked about how blades are measured. And, and we've talked about piercing. So what questions do you have? Anything, anybody? Hi, Dawn. Yeah, I can't wait till we can get back to back to works here. And I can see all your smiling faces in the studio. This is definitely, uh, I have no words. So yeah, I look forward to seeing you too. Um, any questions, guys? No? Okay. Well, I hope you guys are doing well out there, staying healthy and well, taking care of yourselves mentally, physically. It's tough, it's tough, but um, we hope to be back uh, real soon. Um, 
let me know what you guys would like to learn. I'm not sure what I have on tap for next week. I'm still trying to figure out this camera thing because I do want to do some torch work. So it's a mystery of what we'll do next week. I'm not certain. Maybe we'll start on a band ring. I'm not certain. Please uh, put in the comments what you might like to work on. Uh, I don't know if you want to work on bales. I don't know if you want to work on, I don't know what, I don't know what y'all want to do. So uh, let me know in the comments. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. Oh, he's, he's good. A cranky little mister. He's in his bed right now. And um, he was a helper in our last episode. And so uh, sometimes he makes a cameo, a cameo uh, appearance. And uh, he's doing pretty good. He had a bark day uh, earlier this week on the 17th. So we celebrated. He turned nine. They grew up so fast. All right. Well, listen, I hope you're all doing well. And um, please uh, put in the comments what you might like to learn for our next lesson. But I'll be here working hard to get some good content ready for you next week. And uh, I send a socially distance appropriate hug to all of you. Stay healthy, stay well, and I hope to see you all on the other side of this.